Alrighty, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting for giving me this opportunity to present on some of our early work in trying to decipher signatures of type 1 diabetes that are encoded within the T-cell receptor repertoire. I want to start with a little bit of background about um, the T-cell receptor repertoire and or a little bit of background about type 1 diabetes, if I can get this slide thing to work. on. All right, I'll just advance it from here. So the incidence of type 1 diabetes is increasing um, by 3% per year. And one of the first steps in prevention of disease is earlier diagnosis of disease. Um, type 1 diabetes has many genetic associations. Um, but the problem with this is that classifiers for using genetic risk um, do not differentiate type 1 patients with type 1 diabetes and their relatives nearly as well as they uh, differentiate type 1s versus controls. And um, we have evidence um, based on histological evidence, we see infiltration of T cells within the islets. And so um, what we need is a T cell biomarker of disease so that we can uh, track disease progression but currently, the, the gold standard biomarker and what is used in diagnosis are autoantibodies, which only tell us about um, autoantigen presentation and not destruction of, of beta cells. And so what we hoped to do was use the T cell receptor repertoire to be able to predict um, whether that repertoire came from a control patient or type 1. And then in the middle here, we also have access to patients from first degree relatives and second degree relatives um, because of the importance of genetics in this disease. And so we assembled a data set with 1,600 repertoires, um, and this is from controls as well as type 1s, and then the relatives that I just mentioned. And because of the genetic um, impacts of this, we also have done extensive genotyping efforts on these with 924,000 SNPs, which enables us to um, impute four-digit HLA as well as look at type 1 diabetes SNPs of interest and um, SNPs involved in immune tolerance. We also have the autoantibody status on these samples. And so to give an overview of some of the metadata relevant to type 1 diabetes, that's important to keep in mind when looking at this data. I have plotted on each row is one of the groups, so controls, first degree relatives, second degree relatives, and type 1s. And then here's the age distribution. It's important to note that the age distribution of the um, type 1s is younger than the controls because that's these are just the samples that we get in the, in the clinic. Um, it is nice that we do have um, kind of like an age match, at least a, a mode in the first degree relatives, which corresponds to the um, siblings of these patients, and then the, the parents of the patients in the um, other one. I've also plotted the uh, distribution for high risk HLA alleles. R689 is one example of um, one of the SNPs associated with type 1 diabetes and the total autoantibody count for these, for these samples. So at a very global level, we wanted to look at differences between repertoires. And so we've heard a lot about diversity. And so we looked at diversity profiles um, that Victor talked about at his uh, talk on um, data analysis. And each row in this heat map here is one diversity metric where we varied alpha from uh, 0 to 10 in, in steps of 0.2. And this weighted the lower, higher frequency clones more or less. And we see overall that all of these diversity indices um, show that this right cluster over here has higher um, diversity. And if we look at the top row here, the orange is the type 1s. And to make that a little bit more clear, the bottom uh, annotation here is blue for type 1s and red for everything else. And we see an enrichment of the type 1s in this uh, right in this right cluster, as better seen here. We also looked at overlap between uh, repertoires, and so pairwise overlap to see if there was increased overlap within type 1s. And indeed, we do see um, using Moiseta overlap index to look for both um, overlap of clonal sequence and clonal frequency. We see that there's, again, two main clusters that um, there are present in this right cluster um, once again, has, has more orange on the top, which is the type 1s, and the blue on the bottom, type 1s, and red, everything else. We also see clustering by autoantibody status, um, which is interesting here. 
We then looked at the presence of previously published autoreactive sequences in our data set to see whether there was more incidence of these clones in type ones versus controls. And what's interesting here is that each, this plot shows each clone um, plotted and on the x-axis, the number of controls that had that particular sequence and on the y-axis, the number of type one patients. And interestingly enough, the, the previously published autoreactive clones are right there in the middle with equal incidence in type ones and controls. So to, to leverage this really large data set, we wanted to be able to predict disease status based on the repertoire features. And so we um, started with just binary classification tasks and balanced the classes to make sure we're not biasing the algorithm in any way, um, and split into train and test data and applied some machine learning methods and repeated this 20 times to assess the validity of these, of these models. And we looked at subsequence um, information. So we, uh, like we've seen in many presentations, looked at Kamer frequency distributions um, and used that in a random forest classifier. And so on the top here is the classification task of controls versus type ones, and on the bottom is first degree relatives versus type ones. On the left side um, is where we only look at subsequence of three, three um, amino acids. And we have a median accuracy there of around 66% accuracy. If we also um, account for the position at which those three MERS show up, we see that that increases the accuracy a little bit up to around 70% uh, median accuracy. The first degree relatives versus type ones is a much, much more um, complicated classification task as we imagined um, and adding the position doesn't really um, uh, improve anything there. And so we had to like engineer those features and look at um, position, optimal uh, subsequence length, but we plan on moving into deep learning methods so that we don't have to engineer these features and we can better understand the contextual dependencies of these KMERS that may be involved in um, specificity of them. We also need to uh, come up with some better methods of uh, addressing some of the potentially confounding factors of age and HLA, um, because we, we noted the imbalance in age and um, HLA really drives uh, risk for, for disease. And to help with the age problem, we are adding 900 more older type one samples to the cohort. So, this machine learning analysis at the scale is only possible due to another software platform that we're developing called AminoMel. Many of you may have seen this poster yesterday uh, by Milena. And this platform is meant to analyze both experimental data as well as simulated data where we have a ground truth. And um, the three main goals of AminoMel are to be able to predict these, uh, predict whether disease status on um, repertoire level or specificity for the sequence level recover those features and use that in the future um, design of therapeutics. And I have a poster today, uh, poster 214, if you want to talk any more about this. And you probably already saw that poster yesterday. And I'd like to thank my uh, mentors, Dr. Brusco, uh, Dr. Greff, and Dr. Sande for all of their amazing help. Thank you. That was really nice. Questions? We have time for maybe one or two. Now, now I see who's talking. Yeah, um, so what I showed was not frequency of the, of the autoreactive clones that are uh, equal, but the, just the incidence, so whether they were present or absent. So um, I think it's, there's many studies showing presence of autoreactive clones in controls. Um, maybe it's a difference in phenotype that's, that's different. Um, so that could be a potential explanation for that. And the frequencies also didn't change too much. Um, as for effector versus regulatory, that is one issue that we obviously have in this. But we wanted to, um, at this data set size, we wanted to just look at whole peripheral blood because that's what would be most applicable for um, clinical setting, clinical diagnostic setting. And so 
we are going to be doing some more um, focus studies on subsets um, with HLA matched um, stuff so that we could potentially look at those in peripheral blood and, and um, see how that compares to this and see what, what's different. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions, so let's thank all our speakers for this session.